The arrogance of man is thinking nature is in our control, and not the other way around. Let them fight. Don't act like a big shot, Tim. You just got the car. You have your fear, which might become reality. You have the joy, which is reality. Welcome to the Sludge Cash special episode called the Monster Movie Stomp Down. This is the episode that you'll hear every month where me, my father Mark, and then a special guest, maybe two, will gather together and watch a selected giant monster film, um, and then we will do nothing but just banter about that movie for however long we feel is necessary. Um, since this is the first episode, I'm such a huge Godzilla fan, um, so is Mark. Mark introduced me to that um, as a small child. Uh, I decided that the best way to do the first Monster Movie Stomp Down would be n no other way other than doing the original Godzilla and the Americanized counterpart Godzilla King of the Monsters. So here with me today, and will be with a every episode, is my co-host for this part of the show. This is Mark Reagan, my father, and then we have a special guest, Ruben Delgadillo, a good friend of mine and a fellow Godzilla fanatic from Corpus Christi, Texas. Um, Mark, you want to go ahead and say hi, maybe a little bit about yourself? Uh, hello, I'm Mark. I'm obviously uh, Sludge's father. And uh, way back when, uh, my first monster movie I turned him on to is one of them was we're going to go through tonight, and that's King of the Monsters, and excited to get this going. Ruben, you want to say hi to everybody, give a little bit about yourself? Hello, my name's Ruben. Uh, I've been a Godzilla fan since... Oh, around the second grade is the first time I saw a Godzilla movie. I actually faked being sick so I could stay home and watch Godzilla on the <laughs> nice. TV. And I've been, ever since then, I've been an avid Godzilla fan. Um, kind of like Mark, I uh, turned on my son to it. He's just as big as a Godzilla fan as I am. And uh, we watch them multiple times a year. <laughs> and uh, we own them all. And, uh, we just love everything Godzilla. Awesome. So, obviously, big Godzilla fans. We will be doing a lot of Godzilla movies on this monster movie, Stomp Down. Actually, me and Mark and Talking have decided that we will go chronologically in order for all 30-plus Godzilla films from top to bottom. And to keep things interesting, we'll be doing those every other month, and then we'll slap another giant monster film in between. Um, and since we're all big Godzilla fans here, and we're starting with the biggest monster, the greatest monster in movie history, we'll just do a little bit quick background. Godzilla obviously came out in 1954. He was a dream of Ishiro Honda. Uh, they actually called him the Big Four of the original Godzilla creators, creators which was Ishiro Honda, Tomoyuki Tanaka, Aiji Tsuburaya, and Akira Fukube. Now, Ishiro Honda and Tomoyuki Tanaka were the biggest fathers for this because Tomoyuki Tanaka got the idea flying back um, to Japan after going, I think it was to China, maybe somewhere overseas for him, um, and he got a chance to see the beast from 20,000 Fathoms, which really inspired him. Now, at the time in Japan, they're barely a decade past the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings, unfortunately, due to us Americans. Um, and they were still reeling from that. That affected them in such a tragic way, and, and most of us today couldn't even imagine what it was like to be Japanese 60-plus years ago experiencing that. But they were still reeling from that, and then, of course, dealing with American control after Pearl Harbor. And then there was more things on top of it that inspired it as well. Not long before... Um, Tomoyuki got the idea for Godzilla. There was another tragic incident that happened to a fishing charter named the Lucky Dragon Number no. 5, in which the entire crew got a little too close to some nuclear bomb testings from the Americans, uh, and they were all affected, all got radiation poisoning. They all eventually died. Uh, the haul that they had ca caught of all the fish made a lot of people sick. People got radiation poisoning you know, inland. Um, so it was another tragic incident where they just reeled from what happened and the terrors of, of nuclear weapons and atomic weapons did to, to the Japanese. So with dealing with that as a country and then seeing the beast from 20,000 Fathoms, Tanaka came up with the idea to create Godzilla as a message of how dangerous nuclear weapons and nuclear power can be. During the time of being hugely under American control, um, the cinema industry was very 
tight on what they could and could not do. They were not allowed to do war propaganda films. A lot of major directors, and including Aiji Subaraya, who directed the special effects for this movie, he was blacklisted for many years prior to this film uh, due to some previous war propaganda films he was a part of. So they had to find a way to get the message across of how terrifying and horrifying this experience was and how dangerous, dangerous nuclear power really is, and that's where Godzilla came from. They went to Toho Studios. He threw the pitch to them. They loved it. It was called Project G, and then everything just went underway from there. They got together the best cast, who, in my opinion, and I'm sure everybody else is here, um, the four, the big four for Godzilla, Tomiyuki Tanaka, Ishiro Honda, who, were, who always directed and produced the first major Godzilla films, except for the second one. Um, they did King Kong vs. Godzilla, Mothra vs. Godzilla, Ghidra the Three-Headed Monster, Godzilla vs. Monster Zero, and they continued to work on those movies throughout Godzilla's entire career. Actually, Tanaka worked on Godzilla all the way through to his death after 1995. He even worked on several other Toho films and uh, finished his career. Ruben, if I'm not mistaken, make sure I'm right on this, it's Mothra, Rebirth of Mothra 1996 was the last film Tanaka worked on. Is that correct? That is correct. Awesome. So he's the father of Godzilla. And, of course, Shiro Honda directed many, many films. Aiji Tsuburaya is known as the father of Japanese special effects, is who came up with the special effects and Godzilla himself as far as the costume design. And Akira Fukube, he's the one who made the amazing musical score that if you just turn it on the radio today, everyone is bound and sure to know what it is. That's Godzilla. And so let's get into it and talk about these movies. But before we do that, actually, I think it'd be kind of cool since we are talking about Godzilla and we're all big Godzilla fans here. What is, and I know we've all got tons of them, what is your favorite Godzilla memory that you have? Ruben, you want to go first on this one? Oh, sure. I kind of alluded to it um, when I introduced myself. My first, I mean, it just brings back childhood memories is seeing the commercial on TV that they were gonna, it was going to be 11 o'clock in the morning on a weekday. And I saw the, the commercial for it, and I saw the commercial, and I had, I had to see it. It was, oh, I guess about 1972, 73, second grade. I'm 51, so I'm just guesstimating. So my memory of that is, is staying home to watch that movie on a little black and white TV that we had at the time. We didn't even have a color TV at the time. It was black and white, which didn't matter for Godzilla. And uh, and just staying home, you know, making being sick so I could stay home just to watch it. Um, that, to me, is one of the greatest memories, followed by the first time I introduced my son to Godzilla, which was uh, Godzilla versus, which one was? Megalon. Godzilla versus Megalon was oh, the first movie. Oh, great movie. Great movie. Yeah. Yeah, it was Godzilla versus Megalon. I remember he was a little kid. I just, you know, maybe four maybe even uh, even sooner than that. And I would put it in for him, and, you know, and it was very kid-friendly, of course. And uh, sitting there and watching it with him and watching him fall in love with Godzilla the same as I did, um, it, it, it's, it's a great memory. So those two there, and, and, and I battle with which one uh, means more to me because uh, watching it with my son just was incredible. It's the best thing ever. So um, that that's my memories, or my two of them anyway. Sweet. And something that you guys will definitely, and they have Matt and Tyler, uh, my co-hosts for the main episodes, have to do constantly is reel me in. Um, but a sweet little bit of information for Godzilla vs. Megalon, in case any of you listeners didn't know, um, or you guys here didn't know, that actually was not a Godzilla film originally. Toho actually wanted to cap capsize on... Um, the Ultraman movement at the time. And they wanted their own uh -huh. big superhero to do movies. Now, obviously, they ended up doing Zone Fighter, which was Toho's version of Ultraman. And so because Toho owned the rights to it, they were able to get Godzilla and Ghidra and Gigan on that show. But prior to that, they had a big contest for fans and artists to create a superhero that would be pretty much their... Ultraman, and that's where Jet Jaguar came from. Now, Jet Jaguar ah. was supposed to fight Megalon, who was the monster in it, but because of the decline in tokusatsu and kaiju films at the time, even especially with Godzilla, they did not think, they were too worried that it wouldn't be a big enough film and they'd lose money if it was just solely a Jet Jaguar film. So they decided to bring Godzilla in and Gigan, make it a duo pair fighting movie, and then change the title for Godzilla vs. Megalon. 
little bit of wow. It's kind of like um, God's, uh I had just read this Godzilla versus the uh, sea monster was originally supposed to be King Kong versus the sea monster. That's very true. That's what I read. Yeah, and then what happened is uh, Toho lost the right to King Kong. They said, oh, well, we'll just use Godzilla. Yeah. Um, so I had never heard that story about Megalon. That's new to me. Yep. Yeah, they actually, Toho had, um, after Kong versus Godzilla, they had the rights for two more films to use Kong in. Um, but due to the time frame involved, too, yeah, they end up losing the ability to use Kong for the Sea Monster uh, movie. And okay. um, and there's a lot of things like that in Godzilla history where there were lost films or films that were changed that weren't even Godzilla. Um, that, you know, there were some movies that were, there was actually a Frankenstein or a War of the Gargantua sequel um, that turned out to be a Godzilla film. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I'm trying to remember which one it was. I'm wanting to say it may have been somewhere on the long lines of Godzilla's Guy Again. There's a lot of movies being made at that time, and there's a lot yeah, of different yeah. storylines that end up developing into Godzilla vs. Guy Again. Uh, but I mean, they had Mothra thrown in the mix for her own film at that time, Frankenstein thrown in the mix, you know, for his own time. I mean, yeah. even. And the Japanese love Frankenstein. Actually, King Kong versus Godzilla wasn't even supposed to be King Kong versus Godzilla. It was actually King Kong versus Frankenstein's monster. Yeah, uh, I had read that somewhere. Yeah, yeah that they, that's what they originally wanted. So there was there was a lot of I guess they, like Hollywood a lot of things are planned then changed and you know eventually we get something so just so God, yeah, Godzilla yeah. ends the last moment yeah right um, so yeah reeling back in I'll do this a lot so I apologize uh, Mark your wow. favorite Godzilla m- memory well I, I think obviously I was a little kid when I first uh, saw. Uh, Godzilla, but got more excited, so excited, uh, came to the local theater, Godzilla versus the Smog Monster, and uh, th- that it, it probably made my whole summer because it was like, uh, one, going to a movie theater, and two, going to a movie theater to see a Godzilla movie uh, was just phenomenal. And uh, then obviously... 1985 Godzilla me and you uh getting into <laughs> yeah. that and Great and uh, wow what a door I opened when I uh, opened the door for you on those things and here we are however many years later doing a podcast because uh, <laughs> yeah. you're a Godzilla freak so which is great I love it it did it I mean that that I mean what well, definitely has to go down as, as arguably one of my greatest memories I mean because we we initially watched and we were talking about this outside yeah. before we started the podcast Godzilla King of the Monsters on one of those Saturday Night Double Features, and then it was not long after that we ended up almost immediately watching 1985. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I, and while it was amazing getting to watch Godzilla King of the Monsters for the first time, being the first movie I got to see, 85 is what really brought it in for me. 85 still to this day is my absolute favorite Godzilla film to the point where I mean, I've got... I'm only missing, I think, one American released piece of memorabilia from the movie from the 80s. Um, everything else I got, all the Imperial Godzilla figures, all three different sizes, the movie poster, T-shirts, the VHSs, um, I've got it all. I love that film. Um, so, I mean, that obviously would be, you know, moving right into it, one of my absolute favorite memories of Godzilla um, is Dad, you know, introducing me to that. Uh, the other one would probably be... After suffering the disaster that was the 98 Godzilla film, <laughs> being able to go to my local theater in Knoxville, Tennessee at the time and standing at the doors waiting for them to open up so that I can go and see on the big screen Godzilla 2000 uh, when it had came out. That was an experience and a half for me to be able to just say, like, I'm going to the theaters to see a real Godzilla film this time. Um, I'll never forget that day. Uh, actually me and my best friend, Tommy at the time had went and seen it. So, um, he's, he was my childhood hero. I mean, everyone's got their childhood heroes, whether it's, and I had other ones, you know, I mean, Optimus Prime from the Transformers was obviously a big hero. Uh, Raphael from the Turtles, you know, those heroes that us as kids, we look at growing up, whatever era it may be. Um, Godzilla always was that staple for me. I mean, he just made everything in life better and he just took out everything in his path. So I felt like I could too. And, uh. He's he's affect, affected everybody, <laughs> everybody in a big way. I talked about this a little bit on the first episode. I mean, we, we and there's no argument whatsoever that he is the largest pop culture icon in the world. Uh, I mean, over 30 films, multiple cartoon um, series. Actually, Ruben, I'm sure you just learned this in that Godzilla FAQ book that you got that I got recently. Um, the Hanna-Barbera cartoons, actually, the guy who voiced Godzilla was the same guy who played Lurch 
in the Adams family. And then yeah, uh, I did read that. Yeah, I thought that was that pretty was cool. That was that was a new one for me at the time. Uh, the guy who voiced Godzuki uh, was the same guy who did Scooby Doo. Um, so it was pretty cool. Then bringing it over here, but I mean, tons and tons of toy lines since the beginning. I mean, just millions of toys across the world. Comic book series on both the you know the you know in Japan and in America, from Marvel to DC to uh, not DC, sorry, Marvel to Dark Horse to um, IDW yeah. currently. Um, you know, and then of course Japan released m- mangas for almost every movie at the time. Then had their own series to Hollywood star. On the Walk of Fame, um, Lifetime Achievement Award, legit only fictional character to be a, l- a legal citizen of a country. What what was the hotel name of the hotel that it, they have him? It's this it's Sinjuku Hotel, right? Yeah. The Godzilla Hotel. Yeah. It's it's attached yeah. to it's attached to the main Toho Cinemas um, in the Shinjuku District, if I'm not mistaken. So they've got a lot of facilities with with Toho. They're such a big. They're the biggest movie studio in Japan. Uh, most major theaters that you go to see a movie in Japan is a Toho theater. Very few theaters you go to actually aren't owned by Toho. Um, so, I mean, they're massive all across the country. And, uh, yeah, bringing him up and having him at that hotel uh, is pretty sweet. Um, there's just there's so much we talked about with this character. He's a, he, you, know, you can look at his silhouette and uh, know exactly who he is. You can hear his roar and know exactly who it is. So, in yeah. saying all that... Let's jump in. Let's start talking about these movies. We decided to do a double feature for this one for the first one because, one, it's Godzilla, and we love to talk about Godzilla, but it was interesting because this original film has an Americanized counterpart that most people listening to this has probably seen the American version instead of the Japanese original. Um, the American version was actually called Godzilla King of the Monsters. That's the one we'll start with first, uh, because I feel in talking to Ruben and Mark prior to this that we'll get through that one a little bit quicker than we will the Japanese version, because the Japanese version has got a lot more history and meat to it. Um, so starting now, Godzilla King of the Monsters. That movie came out April 27th, 1956. They took the original Godzilla movie um, when they brought it over here, and they had cut out... Um, 16 minutes of the film, I think, uh, and then replaced yeah. it with American scenes. They hired Raymond Burr, who was hot off the press with, actually, I think the movie he did just prior to this was Rear Window with Alfred Hitchcock. Um, so he was a big up-and-coming actor over here in America at the time and uh, hired him to play the character of Steve Martin. Um, and then they changed some scenes around in the movie. It's something we'll talk about a lot here um, is... They kind of re-edited and reorganized it to fit the American audience more, filmed more scenes with American actors. Actually, there's only, other than stand-ins, there's actually only two credited American actors for this, and that's Steve Martin, which was Raymond Burr, and then the security officer that's with him the entire movie, uh, Steve calls him Tomo, uh, is a guy named Frank Iwanaga. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this was really the only major film he had well, done. Didn't he, didn't he at one point calls an, an editor... Uh, in the movie, to, yes, yeah. that's right, I, and no. I don't think he's credited. I'm not yeah. sure who he is. Ruben, you know anything about you know who Mark's talking about? No, because he was. I, I don't know if he actually talked to that. I mean, he was talking to him, but I don't know if we heard his voice on the other end. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, they, that. They, they yeah. even show him. Yeah, on they the show him talking. Yeah. And I don't remember who that was. Oh, that's that. right. Yeah. They sure do. You're yeah. absolutely right. Um, no, I guess he's uncredited because you're right. They, he's talked to him, and, and and he's on the other end. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, so I don't think he's credited because, I mean, when you go through the credits on the, the King of the Monsters, I mean, they, they'll credit Raymond Burr, obviously, before anybody else. And then the only name that I can re- recall is Frank and Winagas, and that, they don't even call him Tomo in the credits. It's just security officer, um, which is odd to me because right. he's named Tomo. But uh, So they brought it over here, and, and when they brought it over here, um, Jewel Enterprises is who picked it up. They are the ones who funded. They dropped uh, about $650,000 into the film. Um, redoing the scenes and then going through the releasing. It was actually odd because most films at the time and of course to today, they're distributed by one company across the entire country or the world. Uh, This was an interesting scenario where two companies sent this movie West Coast and East Coast. The West Coast, which would end up being the print that was released on VHS for everybody, uh, all the way to today, even the Criterion Collections release um, a few years ago, was the one by Transworld Releasing um, that came out on the western side of the United States. But Embassy Pictures 
partnered and released it for the eastern side of the United States. Uh, so they only had 650000 invested in it. They ended up grossing theatrically $2 million. So it was a huge hit here in America. Uh, absolutely loved it. Um, to, uh, to the point where it was so big and, and did so well that when Toho ended up doing the second Godzilla film, actually prior to this, because the second Godzilla film came out in 1955, King of the Monsters didn't come out to America until April 27, 1956, that they, I believe it was Jewel Enterprises, may have been, or it, was, or it definitely was Transworld Release and had a part of it, they were going to make an entirely new Godzilla film, or monster film, called The Volcanic Monsters, and had actually gotten approval from Toho to use Godzilla Raids again, taking out all the Japanese acting scenes, only using the monster scenes, and even got the suits license. And Toho had sent both suits, actually, no, I think they created a new Angor suit, but sent two suits over, um, who, who've since been lost because the company went bankrupt, uh, to create new monster scenes for the volcanic monsters. Um, so Godzilla was huge over here. And I honestly think that if it wasn't for how big he was here, it, 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 it definitely helped how big he became worldwide. Uh, because of what it did here in America. Um, you know, a couple um, things that were changed in this film, and this is what we can start going into talking, is is the changing of the continuity of the film. The scenes were changed, what was taken out as far as context, because this movie took out the major theme of the devastation of atomic bombings that had happened to America. Um, they really, they talk about it, but it's very much... Removed, and according to things I've read, it's, from, uh, yeah, it's, it's subdued. It's very, yeah. They they try to keep it under the radar for most of the movie. Oh yeah, and I think from what I understanding is, is things that I've read is, is that they had I can't remember. I think it was Jewel Enterprises had stated that it, it was they had done that because of American vets of the war. They felt that it would have put a bad taste in their mouth, so they changed a lot of that. So another thing, and that, that and that makes a lot of sense because you know you forget you know there was World War Two and there was Pearl Harbor and so they did not want. I'm sure there was a bad taste in the vet's mouth from from that because you know they just came back from war. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and you, yeah. you look at it. I mean, even the Japanese version didn't really. They never went above and beyond because they, I mean, couldn't, honestly. But they never really painted Americans as these evil bad guys in the film. No. It was always we. It was always we. He, they yeah. never yeah. pointed the finger. It was always we. I noticed that throughout the film. But it was always we. Even in the Americanized version, it, w it was when it was mentioned, it was we as mankind. And that was it. Yeah, and I think that that specifically because it was we carried over very well for for both yeah. films, both films, um, on this one. So I mean, the movie did great over here. Obviously, helped spawn and all the sequels and what Godzilla has become to this day. One cool little fact that I found out during this uh, watching these two movies and looking up to find if there's anything I didn't know about these films, um, well, because it's kind of hard to come by now at this point in my life and. Um, I found something I didn't know, and maybe you guys would find interesting. That, and I always wondered as a kid, and even today watching, growing up, you ever notice how Ogata and Sarazawa, two main characters, for those who aren't listening, Ogata uh, works for the Navy. He's a love interest of a character named Emiko Yamane. Um, he is dating Emiko, but Emiko's technically engaged to Dr. Sarazawa. Pre-arranged um, marriage. Yeah, nice yeah. little love triangle thing there. <laughs> yeah. um, Dr. Sarazawa is who creates the Oxygen Destroyer that ends up destroying Godzilla. Um, but Ogata and Sarazawa, previous to the film time frame, have a history together that's not described or explained, but it's clearly there. They've known each other for a long time. But I always noticed yeah. watching it, I don't know if you guys ever noticed how similar... In the in the King of the Monsters version, the dubbing, those two sound alike. Have you ever noticed that? I like at some points I was Not like paid attention that, that much of attention. Then well, I mean I pay attention yeah, to like I, I know <laughs> yeah everything when it comes to these movies. Yeah. If Ruben, did you ever notice that how much how similar they were as far as the the voice actors for them? I, I did, but I just uh, I, I think I know where you're going with this. I just attributed it to bad dubbing. 
<laughs> we contribute oh, so yeah, much to right. that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Well, I, you know, and I, I once at one point had even thought that maybe it was George Takai, but George Takai, who everyone knows from Star Trek, um, did right. so much dubbing for Japanese films uh, that were taken internationally and overseas. But he actually didn't even start his first Godzilla film until Raids Again. So it ended up not being him. Found out that it was an actor named James Hong who dubbed both the characters. So it was one uh -huh. guy dubbing both of them. Now, do you guys know who James Hong is? I have no idea. Ruben? Me neither. No, you guys, sir. You guys know him better than probably most actors, but you have no, you, you wouldn't even realize that he's got over 430 acting credits in his career. Wow. Still, still alive, still kicking. He's done movies, cartoons, video games. What people today most would probably know him as, more than anything else, especially kids of today, is he is Mr. Ping, Poe from Kung Fu Panda, the, his yes. father, the, yes. the, the, the bird. Oh, yeah. Yes. That's James Hong. <laughs> um, now, you know, he's wow. done it. He's done, I mean, he's even done, he was, um, I don't know if either of you played Diablo 3. I love that game. Or Dad has. You've played, yeah. Mark, oh, you've yeah. played it. Covetous Chin. That's also James Hong. Oh, wow. And uh, wow. now, maybe our favorite role because of, I mean, I know that, Ruben and, and Mark, you guys are a little older than me, but because of Mark, I grew up in that era that you guys grew up in. Um, right. By choice or not by choice, it was still an awesome thing. Um, yeah. He played and acted. He was Lo Pan in Big Trouble in Little China. Oh, I know exactly who you're yeah, talking see, about. Yeah, there you yeah. go. So, yeah. <laughs> Diablo 3, yeah. Kung Fu Panda, what? I don't know what that yeah. is. Yeah. Big Trouble in China? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now we're talking. Um, so, but yeah, then that, that was one of, that was an early in James's career. He started off like a lot of Japanese actors coming over here dubbing movies uh, internationally. Yeah. And uh, that was one of the big films for him uh, was that. And it kind of says wow. a lot, too, for how few voice actors they had when this guy's having to do multiple voices, you know, at the time. So, um, yeah, but, uh, I did read that they had trouble, um, casting a bunch of voice actors and even, even for the American scenes, you know, uh, back of the heads instead of, you know, uh, faces on some of the characters, because, um, you might've noticed during the film, when they're talking, he's talking to some, but when Steve Martin's talking to somebody, a character in the film, of course, they shot that actor. So they got actors to stand in for them, and it's the back of their head. And you might have noticed that throughout the American Oh, film. absolutely. I noticed it yeah. right away. Yeah. Well, you're it's only in... the back of their head. Uh, yeah, it's only the back uh, of their head. Well, and that, that's perfect segue. Uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Ruben. Yeah, so, uh, uh, but I did read that they had trouble casting actors because there just wasn't a big pool of them to draw from here on, uh, in, on, on, you know, of course in America. So, um, they did have a lot of trouble and, uh, with the voice actors also finding different ones. And that might be, that's why they used the same actor. Maybe had them try to change the, you know, just a little bit on the voice to make it sound different, but you're right. They, they, they sound the same. So, uh, but I did read that somewhere. Um, they had trouble. They had a lot of trouble finding actors to, to do that. Well, and Ruben and you, briefly touch base on one of the things I liked about this film. And so that, I think that'd be a perfect segue here. Let's go ahead and talk yeah. about, and Ruben, if you want to go first, um, what did you like about King of the Monsters? Well, what I liked about King of the Monsters is how they, even though they Americanized it, made it into a typical monster movie, that emotion. And I guess just from, you know, photosynthesis, it just came through, even though it was Americanized. You know, like most monster movies made in in, in the fifties, where it's just uh, you know, like Tarantula. And, and them, it was, was just oh yeah, the first yeah, one on the mind. There was Tarantula. Yeah, they, they get eradicated. Yeah, they get eradicated, and they come after you. And there's no backstory other than you know the military were doing some testing in the desert or something like that, and we got to kill them. And uh, what I liked about what they did with this movie, and I, I tried real hard to separate it from Gojira, the original one. I, I wanted to, to like it and do my likes and dislikes independently, but it, it's very tough because I saw Gojira first when I was watching these two movies. Um, but what I liked is the, the emotion still came through. It was still terrifying. 
it was still scary. And 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 uh, Raymond Burr, Steve Martin, did an excellent job um, when he's narrating this thing, and he's he's making that recording for his editor. I mean, he's sweating, and he's just got a look of terror on his face. Um, that's what I liked about it is they were able to get some of it, not all of it, but some of it to to come on through. And of course, you know, I like that they made the story still about Godzilla and the ramifications of, of you know, even though they don't come out and say it, it's this is what happens when, you know, we, we fool around with nature. Um, that's what I liked about it most. I agree with all that, especially them being able to still, yeah, changing so much, but still keeping that horrific feel yeah, to I it. Yeah, I mean, it was still, it, it, it did lose a lot compared to the first one, but I'm oh, trying to be, like I said, I'm trying to be, I'm from Gojiro from the original, I'm sorry, but that being said, independently, if you, let's say you didn't even know, because most people in America, yeah, they knew about Godzilla, but they watched, they went and sat in the theater, they had no idea what Gojiro was, what it was, you know, that movie was like. They just knew King of the Monsters. I just knew King of the Monsters until that, you know, because that's all there was for us to, you know, unless you got yourself a bootleg in, or new Japanese, <laughs> right? you weren't going to you weren't, you weren't see that. the original Gojira. Yeah, you just weren't going to do it, you know, and I had, uh, you know, I didn't see Gojira till maybe, geez, maybe 10 years ago it was the first time I saw it. I, Before then, it was cute. Yeah. If I'm Go not ahead. mistaken, I had my first viewing of Gojira. Um, I was, it was sixth grade. Um, at the time, I had learned of a company in New Jersey who were still still around, Video Daikaiju, mm -hmm. and they were pretty much our only source for for at least a decade here in America to get imported films from Japan. And they were 15 bucks a pop. You, you know, of course, if you buy three, you get one free. So I always mowed, I mowed lawns. Uh, Mark worked for a company called Pizza Plus here in Tennessee, and I mowed lawns for several stores just to make money to order from Video Daikaiju. And I ended up ordering. Uh -huh. That was one of my first, per my first purchase was I got did the three, got the fourth for, for free. I got the original Gojira. I got Gamera 2, Advent of Legion. Um, then I got Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla and Godzilla vs. Destroya in the same oh, wow. pack. Yeah, so I, I think it was a good purchase. But yeah, so I was fourth or fifth. And were, fifth they all in, were they all in Japanese? Yeah, they were they actually, they were the, um, yep, they were subtitled. They were the Toho releases um, that were, they had created uh, for imports. And, uh, um, and I'm assuming VHS or DVD? Oh, VHS, definitely. That, yeah, that, that's his own. That's his only way there. to go. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I would still watch only VHS today if I could. <laughs> that's the I, I will yeah. for to to my grave will state that that's the greatest video format ever, um, and I can argue okay. that with anybody who wants to to disposition me on that one because I can prove you wrong. But uh, that's that's neither here nor there. Um, so, um, Mark, what did you like about well, King uh, Monsters? I, I think that especially when, when comparing both movies, uh, obviously. Obviously, Raymond Burr um, adding the Americanized version as a kid um, made it you know a whole lot better for for me growing up when I first watched it um, yeah. because it was Americanized and, and I and because I didn't have a clue with Japanese or anything like that and and uh, exactly. uh, and so that it made it made it awesome but even in both movies and i was uh i was telling the sludge earlier i was like when godzilla comes up over that mountain for the very first time and the in the looks on everybody's faces it just gives me uh, an uh, an adrenaline rush and i just love it that's my favorite part and, and a lot of times I'd, i would rewind back and, and watch it again and uh so it's it's really good but i think as far as uh king of the monsters it has to it has to do with raymond burr i thought he did a terrific job in it and uh especially as a kid understanding what was going on and i watched this movie with uh um my granddaughter and you know she's like why is he sweating so much why is he you know and she's noticing things like that and it's like you know it was pretty crazy but uh obviously uh uh i, I think raymond burr and adding the and the American eyes just really pumped it up for me and just changed my view on, on Godzilla. So yeah. I would have to say with, when it comes to 
I, I mean, obviously, I'm a much I, I'm a much larger fan of the Japanese version of Gojira. Now, it doesn't mean I dislike King of the Monsters. Cause I love it because it's one of the first movies I ever se- I've ever seen. Remember, is always one of my favorite actors since Rear Window. Um, I, I think that's one of the greatest movies ever made. I'm a big fan of him. I even liked him in. Um, I don't want to get it wrong. It wasn't Matlock. It was. Uh, oh dang it! Ironside. He was Ironside, and he was Perry Mason. There yeah, you Mason. go, Perry yeah, Mason. Perry That's Mason. right. I was like, man, yeah. Yeah. I'm getting mixed up here. You yeah. know, so he, he's yeah. he's a great actor. I mean, even in '85, '85, yeah. the American scenes are horrible. Now that I watch it as, as an yeah. adult, I mean, it's it's Dr Pepper everywhere. Dr. I mean, sure, yeah, oh Dr. Pepper man, commercial. it's so bad. <laughs> yeah. But but Raymond Burke saves it you know what i mean solely by himself those american scenes he rectifies all the you know bad things about it so i'm a big fan of his acting and i loved him in the movie but i would think my two things that i like the most about this film especially that i like to point out is one and this is something you touched on a little bit earlier ruben was how much they attempted they actually worked hard to try and put raymond in the japanese scene itself, moved, taking him to Tokyo, having the scenes, you know, there were sets they created to look as close as possible to the sets they used in the Japanese film, having those actors stand in, so, yeah, you'd only see the back of their heads and them talking, but doing their best to make sure it looked like he was interacting with that actual cast. You know, I remember um, yes. in the King of the Monsters version, the... Um, the first uh, debate the, the at the the assembly they have where they're talking to Dr. Imane and the people from Odo Island when he and, and Raymond's in there or Steve Martin's in there and they're talking about Godzilla and he walks out you know you got that scene where he's standing there talking to Dr. Yamane, which I mean it's not and you can see it nowadays but they did they tried so hard and it did so well in most parts actually I think my only complaint as far as them trying to do that was literally just the Odo Island scenes where Raymond's where they're running up when Godzilla first appears they run up the mountain, and honestly, if you watch on VHS, you can't notice it. But where I've got the Criterion Blu-ray, it's beyond clear <laughs> that uh, there's yeah. painted backdrops. You know, so I mean, that's my only complaint. But it's like yeah. if, if you watch on VHS, you're not even going to notice it. So I, I really liked Raymond Burr. I liked how they really went above and beyond trying to make sure and implement him into the Japanese scenes filming the scenes that they did, and the pacing was great. Um, not that the pacing with Gojira was bad, because I thought it was flawless, but yeah. here in America, in comparison to most any other country, our editing and pacing of films are much quicker. Um, because, yes. you know, I don't know if it's the audience's attention span is much yeah, shorter. Yeah, yeah, they gotta yeah. keep the audience attention. Keep it going. And they, and they really kept mm-hmm. it going. Um, which I thought was really good. Now, there was times where it was at a fault, and what we'll do is, is we'll just segue right here into what we didn't like, and I'll start, is during the pacing, they removed and changed so many scenes to try and keep it Americanized that it kind of hurt a lot of the message and some of the more impactful scenes from yes. the original one. You know, when Ruben, me and you were talking... Uh, when we're reviewing these movies, um, one of the key scenes that we both had talked about was the mother in the streets with her kids. She's consoling her kids. And in the Japanese versions, it's a little bit longer of a shot. But in the Americanized version, it's quicker. And then they don't subtitle it. Which, yes, kind of, you know, exactly. I mean, yeah. and I can understand why because we're Americanized and we don't make it horrifying. But when you understand or you, you, you watch Gojira subtitled, she's telling those kids. It's okay. We're going to see Daddy soon. Uh, that's oh, yes. that's so heartbreaking. Oh, yes. that's I mean, perfect. Yeah, I mean, it, it just it reaches out and <laughs> grabs you and just pulls your heart out of your chest when you're watching it. So the pacing and the editing they they did do to make it more Americanized, I do felt hurt the film in aspects like that or aspects like the daughter or the the. Um, yeah, the daughter at the hospital scene. Um, you know, you, you when you go to the Americanized version. And Raymond Burr's in the hospital, and Emiko goes, you know, before she goes to talk to him, you hear this little girl crying. Well, in the Japanese version, her mom is put on a cart, there, or a little pad there in front of her, and her mom dies right in front of her eyes. And yeah. the, that's the daughter yeah. crying. And then Emiko actually picks up the young girl to try and console her, make her feel better. I mean, and that's another one of those scenes where it's just like, oh my gosh. I mean, it just pulls at your heartstrings. And yeah. because of the editing, I felt like that, those emotional connections 
were cut out in King of the Monsters, um, which really kind of yeah. and, and really did kind of downplay the horrifying, tragic feel of the film. Um, that was a big thing. The other thing too. Um, I've already said the poorly, ba- poorly painted backdrops on Odo Island, which is only if you watch it on Blu-ray. Um, the only other right. real complaint I have for King of the Monsters, because it is its own thing, and it is a great movie, yes. um, is the dubbing screw-ups that are in the movie. And, yeah. and um, uh, Mark had brought one up to me, and I didn't even really realize, but like when Dr. Yamane is talking about Godzilla after they first see him, he states that Godzilla is over 400 feet tall. Godzilla is 50 yes, meters. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Godzilla is yeah. 50 meters, which is 164 feet. That's a bit different than 400, you know, 400 feet tall. So little and, things and like later that. Later on in the film, later on in the film, when he's talking to his, or oh, he's recording for his editor, he says he's 30 stories high. Which mm, is yes. Feet. Yes. That's the one that Mark had brought up to me. <laughs> it's like, that's yeah. totally different too. So those were the things I didn't like. Um, if you go, if you go online and and actually look for the review on King of the Monsters, the first thing it says is a four hundred foot, one hundred and twenty two meter dinosaur like monster. Is that on um, IMDb? Yeah. I think. Uh, From, uh, that, yeah, 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 yeah. That's I, I remember yeah. seeing that earlier too. Yeah. And uh, which makes a major difference. Well, uh, yeah. yeah. Another misconception is that he's green. Correct. You know, uh, Do you know yeah, what the actual yeah. color of that suit was? I know. You guys know? No. I would say black yeah, just looking at it. Ruben? But it's in uh, gray, I believe. It was brown. That brown, was, really? Yes, that was the wow. only suit that was ever brown. And of course, being black and white, you never know it. But starting with yeah. Godzilla Raids again is when they went to the gray, black, you know, suits. Um, well, you know what? Now that you mentioned that, I remember that because when they're filming it black and white, they have to, they had to use, that's right. Yeah, I remember that. Reading about the actually, I remember reading. It's going to be off subject here. It's about three uh, three Stooges, and how they had to use brown for for some of the grays. So um, uh, that would make Didn't perfect sense. Yeah, actually, so. Another, another one we'll throw in here real quick, because then Ruben will get to what you didn't like about King of the Monsters is which Godzilla film introduced the first actual green suit. Green no, 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 no. I have no dun, dun. idea. Yeah, you have to do the Jeopardy thing. <laughs> yeah, gonna exactly. I'm going I'm to edit that in to this scene. <laughs> we'll, you know, put it in there. <laughs> Double there Jeopardy. Go. It was. I'm going. I'm going through all my Godzilla. I'm going through all the Godzilla films, and it has to be a recent one because I don't remember any of the show us being green. Nope, none of the shows were green. None of the show us were green. None of the uh, the see none of the '90s were green. So I want to say. Uh, Mega Gyrus, maybe? Close, but no cigar. Close? Oh. It, it was actually Godzilla 2000, Godzilla Millennium. It was the first one to have any green tints. Really? Well, I, I, I know it's a follow up to. And it, the reason I say that, I just said before we got on this podcast, I was watching Mega Gyrus. Now, Mega and Gyrus is. Yeah, yeah, because they used the same suit and they did repaint yeah. it and make him more green. They even changed the colors of the spines. I think they were a little bit more purple. Right. In Mega Or more purple. Yeah. But then in Godzilla 2000, there wasn't many uh, two, uh, daylight scenes. So I guess I, it, I've watched 2000 several times. It's one of my favorites. I just never realized it was green. Yeah. So it's not full green like Mega Gears, but it's the first suit that they actually had green paint involved in. Okay. I so got you. It was like, right. a, like a forest green, like a dark green. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, All back right. to uh, King of the Monsters. Ruben, what did you not like about it? What I didn't like about it was basically, first of all, I caught all these little mistakes, like the 400 feet and the 300 feet. You know, I'm sitting there watching it, and boom, that caught me. I was like, wait a minute. No, no. You know, I said, you know, that, that's not right. It's only 164 feet. Why would they do that? And uh, what I didn't like about it is basically it was too choppy. Like, in other words, where there should have been subtitles, there were none. And uh, and that bothered me throughout the film. Like, I would have liked to have known what that, that mom was saying to the kids. And uh, some of them, and instead of subtitles, what they do is they just have have Steve Martin's, I, I call him his translator, because that guy was with him and he was just translating for Steve Martin. Right. He'd say, oh, my Japanese is not too good. And he just, when all they had to do was basically do a subtitle or dub it, you know, for the Americanized version. Well, that's what I should say. They didn't dub it in all the right places. Um, 
that's what I didn't like. I think they could have done a little bit better job with that. Um, and sticking with the original dimensions. I didn't like that they went with 400 feet. I'm sure they did it for dramatic effect. You know, um, I'm not sure back then if maybe buildings in America were taller than the buildings in Japan. And they so if they said 164 feet, that wouldn't impress anybody. Um, uh, I don't know what the reason is for that, but that's the kind of thing that, of course, as a kid, I didn't care. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, yeah I, He's I, huge. I didn't care less, but yeah, I didn't care. This was Godzilla, and it didn't matter. And I think when they did this film, there was not enough attention to detail. If that's the right term. Um, I hate being critical of it. It's tough being critical of a Godzilla film. Um, but I had to find something wrong with it. And that, that's what I found wrong with it. Um, <laughs> uh, other than that, I mean, really, uh, it's, it's great. I love that movie because it was the first one, the first time I got to see Godzilla. So, um, but I would say that now as an adult, I say it's just, it's just a little bit too choppy for me and it wasn't dubbed the way it should be dubbed. And even some of the subtitling. Which that really subtitling is more on the, you know, there's a difference between the subtitles on the Criterion and the classic media, which I own. Yeah, we were um, talking about that uh, yesterday. Yeah. I think. Yep. Yes, because uh, I was watching it and I said, "Well, wait a minute, I just watched it on Stars the other day and uh, on, on TV, and that's not what he said." <laughs> right. You know, and of course it was different. Um, but, and then I read up on it, and I read that the Criterion actually did a better job at translation than the classic media did. Yes. And uh, But that's not the film's fault. That's whoever translate, who's ever doing the translating's fault. So I'm not going to hold that against it. So I'm just going to say that the dubbing and the chopping, yeah, the choppiness of the movie. Mark, what about you? Well, I, I, obviously, you know, I, I'm the older guy. I'm 57 here. And so when I first watched it, you know, um, way back when, and uh, to me, it was phenomenal, you know, and it was great. And, and, and I watched it earlier, and, it, and it's still phenomenal, and it's still great. <laughs> right, and, it and I really didn't yeah. have a, a bad part that I didn't like. I liked the movie all the way through. You know, one of the things I was thinking about was, you know, kids today – I don't know that they could get into King of the Monsters because of the special effects. You know what? Yeah. You know how they're watching movies today, and what are the things going on today? But you didn't have those big special effects. Here was just this big monster, and uh, you know you were like glued to it. And uh, and so to me, um, nothing wrong with the movie. Loved it, start finish. No, nothing bad. That's one of the things I was I was thinking about it when I was watching it. You know, and of course, now me, I am, I don't mind CGI, but I am not a fan of CGI. Unless I mean, very few movies. Not kind for of, Godzilla. Not no, for Godzilla. Yeah, anymore. not at all. Yeah. You know, what I mean, there's there's yeah. some things where I just would rather have, and in most cases, I would rather have the practical effects. You know, um, and for looking back, I mean, look, you look at movies like The Thing, John Carpenter's The Thing, 1982. Those special effects still today, if you watch it on Blu-ray, hold up so oh, yeah. unbelievably well. And looking, watching when I was watching King of the Monsters, I had that thought: is, is like I know this is a man in a suit. I know these buildings are made from thin boards and chalk and and, and paste. And um, for the most part, they did get scenes with the Japanese defense forces as far as tanks. But you got these little remote, remote control ones. <clears throat> they did what they could. But they did it. They you can tell the craftsmanship was through the roof because I felt like yes. even compared to other Godzilla films in the Showa era that came out in the sixties, oh, definitely yeah. they don't compare to the fifty four film. The fifty four film had I feel like the special effects stand the test of time. In that, oh way. yeah, the buildings yeah. You, you could. I mean, I, I noticed that. I noticed the buildings. You know, he's crushing up the building, and I man, that looks so realistic. Yet I know what they're doing there, and I know that it's not supposed to look that good, but it does. Yeah, uh, phenomenal, you know? phenomenal job. So, yeah. Anything else you didn't like, Mark? Yeah. No, I, I am. All right. Well, let's move. Let's let's move and transition over to the Japanese version um, of this movie. Um, you know, the original title Gojira. Um, 
that came out November 3rd, 1954. Fun factoid, uh, Ruben, I may have told you this, but of course Mark knows this, me and my father. I have never worked a November 3rd in my working career since the age of 16. Um, I have taken that day off every year, much like Mark takes off for the Daytona 500, because I do nothing but watch Godzilla films or play Godzilla games. That's Godzilla Day. Uh-huh. I celebrate his oh, birthday. Man. So, and that will continue for decades to come. But um, so it came out November third, nineteen fifty four, and uh, of course we've talked about the big four guys who who, who made the movie: Ashiro Honda, Tomiyuki Tanaka, Aiji Tsuburaya, again the the father of Japanese special effects, Akira Fukube, whose musical scores not just in the Godzilla films, but in many many Tokusatsu, and which is for those listeners who, who might hear us drop the word Tokusatsu, that stands for Japanese special effects films. That's the genre that it's known as. Uh, more also kaiju films, which is just Japanese word for monster. Um, Fukube's work in many movies is just top notch but especially Godzilla you know his score was phenomenal in this movie um Toho of course is the company who created Godzilla and released the Godzilla I do want to mention before we start getting into what we liked and didn't like I do want to mention the cast um for the film at least you know four main people and that of course is Ogata who we talked about earlier is the Emiko's love interest he's you know one of the main characters of the film he's he works for the navy um, that is played by Akira Takarada. Akira Takarada, as far as Godzilla fans, is probably, may arguably be the greatest Godzilla actor there is. He's the most well-known. Um, he doesn't have the biggest run in Godzilla films compared to some other actors. But as far as Godzilla itself and other tokusatsu films, he's probably the top dog that everyone knows. You know, He's an awesome guy, too. He comes over here to America every year. For G Fest, um, unfortunately, this year just found out he actually isn't coming for G Fest this year due to some surgery things. So Akira Takarada, our prayers go out to you for quick, you know, recovery on that. But uh, Godzilla 54 was his breakout role for Ogata, and he got a couple of awards for it. Just phenomenal actor. He actually went on to start many other tokusatsu films and Godzilla films. He was in Mothra vs. Godzilla. Um, He was in Godzilla vs. Monster Zero, Godzilla vs. Sea Monster. He was in King Kong Escapes, Latitude Zero. 1992, he came back and was in Godzilla vs. Mothra again. And of you, course, might, you might think he's reading from that, but he's not. He's staring just, right at me. He just knows all that in his um, head. Godzilla Final Wars, of course, he was in that as well. He was cast to play a small role in Godzilla 2014 by Legendary, uh, but unfortunately that got pulled. Um, so, you know, they did a good job, but I don't know that we'll be able to forgive them for that, hopefully one day. Yeah. Um, so, a uh, huge actor, you know, and, and he was great in... Um, Every role, every role he just captured. Really, he just was one of those actors that really just like I'm on the scene, and you're going to know I'm on the scene. So I, he really, I feel like almost like a Brian Cranston for the Japanese cinema um, was a, an amazing actor. Doctor Sarazawa was played by an actor named Akika, uh, Akihito Harata. He had a much larger. Um, career when it comes to Japanese special effects films. Of course, you know, many Godzilla films, uh, the, the original one playing Dr. Sarazawa, um, he, King Kong vs. Godzilla, he was in um, Godzilla vs. Sea Monster, Son of Godzilla, he was in Godzilla vs. Megazilla, Terror of Megazilla, which I believe was his last film. Yes, was his last Godzilla film. He actually, his last Tokusatsu film was Bye Bye Jupiter, which came out the same year as Godzilla 1984. Great film if neither of you have seen it. Um, definitely watch it. Really, really good. Very much like The War in Space. Have you seen that, Ruben? Yes, sir. Okay, so Bye Bye Jupiter is kind of like a more dra- drama- dramatic right. version of War in Space. So, um, really oh, good. Man. He was also in a lot of the films, Rodan, Mysterians, The H-Man, which is I think Godzilla side the H Man during the Showa era was probably their best film ever. Um, oh. Very good. He was in, of course, the first Mothra. He was in Varan, you know, Latitude Zero. He actually had roles in because um, Subaraya was a big fan of Akihiko, uh, Akihito. Um, he put him in Ultra Q. I think he was in Ultraman a few episodes, and he had a pretty big role in Ultra 7. Um, so he, he branched out from there. Um, of course, the next actor who I really want to um, focus on is, is the actor who played Dr. Yamane, and that's Takashi Shimura. Um, 
Now, Ruben, I did have to write his name down because I could never remember his last name. Uh, but Takashi, of course, was in 19, Godzilla 1954. The reason why he actually came to that film is because he did so much work for Akira Kurosawa. And Akira Kurosawa, of course, did Seven Samurai. Um, and him were great friends, and that's what got him the role in Godzilla 54. Of course, Akira Kurosawa was friends with Tomiyuki Tanaka. Um, so they, they all kind of worked together in their own little clique. Um, so uh, Takashi is a phenomenal actor. He didn't have as big a role in Tokusatsu films in comparison to the samurai films back then, which I thought he was absolutely phenomenal in. His role as Kimbei in Seven Samurai... I think it's his best role. It's just that movie is three hours and some change, and it never gets old. I don't know if either of you have seen Seven, Seven Samurai. Phenomenal film. It is so good. If you can't sit through three hours, um, Tarantino or some, but no, uh, uh, Takashi Meek remade it. Thirteen Assassins is pretty much the same film. Um, yeah, but of course, yeah. oh, great film too. Um, not as good as Seven Samurai, but uh, you know, Takashi was also in Godzilla Raids again. He was in the Mysterians. Um, he was in Mothra, Gorath. Uh, he had a small role in Ghidra, small role in Frank Ghidra Three: The Monster, small role in Frankenstein Conquers the World. Um, two other really good movies that are worth mentioning of his is Seven from Edo and Yojimbo. So I mean, Takashi was he was big in Tokusatsu films, but he was much larger in other films. Uh, great actor. And then of course Emiko, who uh, that actress's name is Momo, Mom Momoko Kochi. Um, she was in, of course, Godzilla 54 that we're talking about. She had a very small role in Tokusatsu films. Actually, I think other than Godzilla, her other other Godzilla film that she had done was her reprising her role as Emiko in Godzilla vs. Destroya in 1995. Um, she did one other Tokusatsu film. Oh, oh, half man, I think, or half human. Half human is what she was in. Um, so I mean, at the time, these actors were nobodies, other than of course Takashi Shimura um, with his roles with Akira Kurosawa films. But I mean, these people, when they hit the scene with Godzilla, their careers just launched big time, and they were all phenomenal. I mean, every one of them I thought were phenomenal in this movie. Um, now, for Gojira at the time, had one of the biggest budgets of any movie back then. It was an equivalent to U.S. dollars. It had a million dollar budget for 1954 it ended up grossing 1.6 million at the box office um, which was really really big they went all out for this movie and a lot of crazy things happened too and some some funny things happened during the making of this film they wanted it to be so realistic that Tanaka and Subaraya went out and scouted locations so if you look at you know, you look at the diet building or any of the things that's in the film they did their best to make sure it replicated exactly what it was in the real world um, actually um, Subaraya and Tanaka were arrested I found out um, through that cool book the Godzilla FAQ that me and Ruben both recently got they were arrested yeah. while scouting locations because they were discussing destruction sequences um, for yes, the movie. I did read that. Yeah. I remember reading that. Um, yeah. And so they were they were arrested and had to get released because of you know once they realized what, you know what they were doing. Um, so I mean they went all I mean all in for this film. You know of course the film's inspired by you know the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Lucky Dragon Number Five incident, and the Beast from Twenty Thousand Fathoms. You know they attempted to do this originally. Subaraya wanted to do the whole movie with stop motion animation, but that was such an expensive special effect because Subarai was a massive fan of Willis O'Brien and his work with King Kong. Um, actually, it was King uh -huh. Kong that inspired Subarai to even do special effects. Um, and uh, yeah. he wanted to, but the cost was way too high with already which they had into it. So he came up with the idea and he created. I mean, he's, the, he's not only the father of Japanese special effects and, and Tokusatsu special effects, he truly created, and I know he had monsters like Frankenstein, Boris Karloff, you know, in the makeup, and, and Dracula, and, and the creature from the Black Lagoon prior um, to no creature was after this. Um, but so you had some special effects where the, you got guys, you know, Lon Chaney's the Wolfman in, in a suit type form, but it's mostly things that were make yeah. up and added on. At this point in, yeah. in cinema worldwide, you never had a man in a suit like what happened with Godzilla. And so I, right. and it spawned worldwide from there. I mean, John, not just John Monster films. I mean, even you, you take it to today, you, if you talk to Alec Gillis, 
or not Alec, it's Tom, uh, would reference sometimes Godzilla being, you know, and of course they do special effects for, they did Predator, they did, you know, they work with Stan Winston on Terminator. They, of course, Tom Woodruff Jr. is most well known for his role as the alien in the alien films from Aliens, the second one on, Um, you know, he was Pumpkinhead. Tsuburaya, I think, truly created that entire realm of special effects for sci-fi and horror. If it wasn't for him at the time, well, I don't know that we'd ever have that. Sudomation is, is his baby. It is. It is. Basically, and, yeah. And, and he had his difficulties. I think the first suit, um, Nakajima, Huru Nakajima, who played Godzilla uh, 12 times, uh, more than any other actor, um, I, sadly just passed away, was it earlier this year? If I'm, I'm No, last year. Um, last year, yeah, yeah. Passed away late last year. He has, couldn't even move in the original suit, so they had to rebuild and no. reconstruct the whole suit. And even the second suit was difficult, and they had it in two parts, and it was two over two hundred pounds. Um, so there well, was, a, yeah, they said that they couldn't even uh, that the takes would have to be three minutes or less because uh, it was just too much for him. Oh yeah, um, well, that, and, and they split and the, the suit. Fil- and the film was uh, yeah, the film was uh, when they filmed, they had to do it at. Uh, uh, they did use a fa- uh, you know fast. Uh, fast speed. I'm losing my train of thought. They had to use double speed to film it to yes. make it look real. The frames per second. So had the increased. lights had to be yeah, the lights had to be twice as bright when he was doing it because of that. So they would have to do it like three minutes or less. Otherwise, I mean, he even passed out at one scene. He approached a building and just stopped. He passed out inside the suit, and they had to go out and you know remove the suit from him, and because uh, they just couldn't. You know, the suit was just too much for him. In fact, in some of these scenes, um, when you only see legs, and they finally came up with something where it's just the legs, and he was wearing suspenders. That's right. I've seen a picture you know, of so, that. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. So. He was wearing suspenders, and it was just the feet because they. it was just, you know, that says a lot about that actor, that he was in that suit and, 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 and you know, had to endure all that well, to it, make this movie. Yeah. Well, a lot of people don't know this is the danger and what actual things they went through. I, I mean, Haruo himself, um, of course, he, um, oh, you know, passed out in this movie um, multiple times. I think multiple, yeah. to more than once. Multiple um, times. Yeah. I, and, I know. I read. I read once uh, the uh, the one that he, the one I read was where he approached the building and. Then he just stopped, so then they yelled cut, and they knew, they knew what had happened. He had passed out, and they went and got him out. Well, and you look in, uh, in Varan, uh, Daikaiju Varan, uh, or Varan the Unbelievable, uh, when it was released here in America, which that's an Americanized version that is garbage, but that's another day. Um, yeah. He actually suffered third-degree burns from that film um, inside wow. the Varan suit. Um, it was during the ending at the airport, and they were shooting out the explosions, and one of the explosions was kind of underneath his abdomen been groin area and ended up giving him third degree burns um you know he dealt with that i remember when i um i can't remember exactly who it was it was i think it may have been tanaka came to haruo during the filming of mothra versus godzilla because they had just started using a new they designed a new rocket to use for missile shots and uh, well they said well, what's it like so they they tanaka or yeah tanaka had them shoot <coughs> pardon me a few of them at a uh piece of plywood and these rockets that they were shooting at Haruo in a latex suit were exploding through this plywood and Tanaka's like they're firing this at you and then Haruo's like well, I, I guess so you know what I mean they went through so much danger even Ken Satsuma Ken Pachiro Satsuma whose first role He's well known for being the second Godzilla. Now, technically, there was three other actors who played Godzilla after Huro retired and Godzilla Gigan, but Ken, Ken Pachiro Satsuma, um, he took over in 1984 or Godzilla 1985 and played Godzilla every movie up until Destroy, Godzilla vs. Destroya. Um, even him, he almost died during the filming of Godzilla vs. Biollante because of the buoyancy of the suit. When they would film the water scenes in the pool, they had to use a crane to push him underwater so that when they move the crane, it would look like he's coming out of the water. And uh-huh. they fed an oxygen tube um, through the suit, and when they pushed him down during one of the scenes in got by Lante, the tube came out. So he was drowning, and he oh. couldn't get a hold of anybody to tell anybody what was going on oh, that um, scary. during that. Uh, even in his first role was as the smog monster. That was Ken Pachiro's first role in a Godzilla film. He was the smog monster. He was also... 
uh, Gigan and Gador Gigan, but during the filming of the Smog Monster, that suit was so heavy and hard to take off and put on Kimpachiro that his appendix erupted during the shooting, and they had to emergency take him to the emergency room for emergency appendix surgery in the suit. They did the surgery while he was still in the smog monster suit because <laughs> they couldn't get off of him. Um, so, I mean, that whole art, I mean, it's a dangerous thing, and these dudes really worked hard to bring yeah. these characters to life and did a phenomenal, phenomenal job, I think. Um, so, I mean, you know, going into this one, um, the tone of the film, of course, is so much somber. It's a very somber tone, very dark, because, again, Japan is reeling and still feeling the effects of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, and the, and the, it's only been, what, nine years? Nine years. They probably years. Even haven't rebuilt yet. They probably haven't even fully rebuilt yet. No. I mean, you got all these people. And, and just imagine going to the movies to see this, and, and how often did it happen in 54 when people would go to the movies to see this, and they would be people who their family members or friends died in the bombings or were yeah. died from the Lucky Dragon number 5. Incident. So, I mean, this was so real to them in a way we could never imagine that when they're seeing the horrors that are going on screen i mean that's a true horror film you know i mean that that to me is more than going to the theaters and seeing you know hellraiser for the first time or something you know like the exorcist you know i mean it's yeah. terrifying but it it's terrifying and in, in, in a short scary way it's not terrifying and it is a, an impactful on your life i mean you experienced yeah. that horror but and now you're seeing it again on the big screen so it, what uh, it, i'm sure it was like ptsd for some of them Oh yeah, I could I could definitely yeah. definitely see that. Oh, when he when he first yeah. uh, destroys Tokyo, uh, and you got the fires going in the back, and it's everything is just annihilated. Uh, you have to think, you know. For me, I mean, uh, he, pictures I've seen of Hiroshima, and 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 you can just have to imagine what the audience in Japan uh, oh, felt like yeah. seeing that. It would at the it time was more you know, of a. For us, it was a monster movie. Maybe for them, it was a horror movie. Oh, I definitely yeah. think it is. I mean, um, yeah. I can't remember if it was Ed Godzazuki or Steve Rifle had wrote a a big uh, wrote a book about the first film and how it, I mean it really was for them. It was just a horror. It was a horror film. I mean, it truly terrified yeah. the audiences then. Um, you know, I mean, so it. it just unbelievably captivated the audience at the time. Um, and that was one of the things with, again, with the American version, a lot was changed. And I think that's what makes this movie so, um, so good. You know, we'll, we'll move right into what we did and didn't like. And I'll, let's, I'll do this a little backwards here. I'll, I'll go with what I didn't like. I'll start this one. Absolutely nothing. Uh, it, when it comes to King of the Monsters, I love that film, and I think it's a great film. But I, you know, I was, it wasn't too difficult for me to find something I could pick out and go, ah, well, I didn't really like that. Now that I've watched it as an adult, and I was telling my wife this, watching Gojira, the original Japanese ones, I, I couldn't find anything. I, it's so difficult that I I nitpicked, and I nitpicked and could find nothing wrong with this film in any aspect. Special effects, acting, storyline, editing, nothing. Toward the only thing I can come up with and only complaint that I had <laughs> dealt with uh, Takashi Shimura, who plays Dr. Yamane, and it was just that I thought his role in acting as Kinbei in Seven Samurai was better than his acting as Dr. Yamane. And, and he was great as Dr. Yamane. You know, I mean, there was, that was my only complaint, and that's not even really a complaint because I think this movie was that phenomenal. Um, the, I mean, some of the things I loved about it, of course, is everything that the message had, the lucky draw. I mean, that whole opening sequence, just imagine sitting there and being a relative of Lucky Dragon number five, because that's what that opening sequence is. I mean, that's straight up yes. Lucky. what happened in Lucky Dragon number five. They could see the explosion, the testing from the boat, and that's what happens. But then you add Godzilla's roar, and you realize, you know, I mean, that's the significance of it. You know, I love that. I love the high-tension tower attack. I thought that was phenomenal. The special effects were great. Um, to me, one of the things I really liked, and I, I really wanted to harp on here for a minute and it was a scene that was taken out from the American version is when Emiko goes down to Sarazawa's lab and he first shows her the oxygen destroyer and he starts to talk about the comparison oh, I'm sorry no it doesn't happen then when when Emiko starts talking to Ogata about what she saw and Sarazawa told her after Godzilla's attack it goes a flashback scene of what really happened 
Sarazawa really goes in depth about the comparison and similarities between the oxygen destroyer and yeah. nuclear bombs. I mean, how nuclear energy can benefit mankind just as much as his oxygen destroyer could in such great ways. And even they, they even moved that into God of Destroya when they brought the oxygen destroyer back is that micro oxygen can be, can be such a beneficial thing, but in the wrong hands, it can be a complete nightmare for all of mankind. Yeah. And th that whole sequence I thought was phenomenal because Sarazawa accidentally creates the oxygen destroyer. But later on in the film, after Godzilla's attack, when when Ogata and Emiko come to to plead with him to use the oxygen destroyer, he refuses. And then what I think is probably it's not my favorite scene in the movie, but could very arguably be the greatest scene in the movie is when the girls' choir comes on the TV. The song that they're singing is called a "Cry for Peace," I think, if I'm not mistaken. And that whole and Sarah Zaw sits down with them and, and just starts looking and you see all the devastation and the pain and the tragedy of what Godzilla, who is just a metaphor for nuclear radioactivity and the atomic bombs anyways, sees the, what it's caused, changes his mind and realizes that he has to use the oxygen destroyer to stop Godzilla. Uh, that was huge. That was just, I mean, in the American version, it was just kind of like, oh, well, we've got this weapon, the oxygen destroyer, and it'll work. Um, in the Japanese yeah. version, they really dug home onto how dangerous our inventions as mankind are. And not just to us, but to the world in general. So I think that was a very big scene that I loved in that movie that, I, that was taken out. Um, and... Uh, it, it just—it was very impactful. He thinks it's—he thinks it's so dangerous that he takes his own life in the process of doing right. it. Right, that's right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that was one thing I love too—is is yeah. that that scene. I mean, he ends up telling Ogata the last thing he says is for him and Emiko to be um, happy together. Because if you—if you go back and watch, um, you know, throughout the whole movie, little bits in here there, because I got that love triangle going on, that Emiko and and Ogata are constantly saying, "We've got to tell Sarah's all about us. We've got to tell Sarah's all about us." But they never get to actually tell him about them but he knew i think in, in king yeah. of the monsters they make reference to that she goes to him but he kind of blows her off and says hey i've got this you've got to see this mm -hmm. oxygen destroyer yeah yeah and he, kind of blows he stops her, off her he stops yeah. her tells her oh he knows what's about to me in my opinion yeah he knows what she's going to tell him and then he changes the subject say hey let me go show you something yeah yeah and then she he takes her down it's like he knew uh what was going on. He was not, you know, he's a smart guy. He figured it out. Oh yeah. So, and I yeah. think, yeah. So, um, and we'll move right on to one of you guys, but I, I do got to state my favorite scene in this film is now, of course, depending on which version of the movie you're watching, but in, in Gojira, cause that's the one we're talking about. And Godzilla's first yeah. initial attack on Japan uh, or on Tokyo when he comes comes uh, on shore. Of course, everyone who's seen the movie or either version of the movie or seen a promo of anything Godzilla has seen Godzilla do the stopping the train. You know, uh, yeah. that scene is historic. It's not that scene, but it's right before it. As he's walking up to those train tracks, there's that angle shot where you kind of get just his neck and head. And the lighting on his pupils kind of reminds me similar to the GMK Godzilla that Shusuke Kaneko did, um, and got and Godzilla Mother King Ghidorah all monsters all attack. There's no pupils. It looks like. I mean, he looks, he looks like horror itself. He looks soulless. You know what I mean, there's no emotion. He's just moving, and his there's just eyes are white, pure white, and it, was, it had to be because of the lighting effect, but. That scene right there, to me, was the only time, um, well, other than some of the scenes in maybe 84, but that scene, for me, really said, this is not a giant monster that you're rooting for. This is this is death, you know, walking up. And so that scene, for me, was my favorite. I mean, that was just, that, that I'm in awestruck every time I see that sequence. Ruben, what'd you like? Or didn't like? We're starting with didn't like. What didn't you like about the movie? Well, it was hard. I, I'm like you. I watched it, and I watched two versions of it, and still couldn't find anything I liked, right. didn't like about it. And I just couldn't do it. I watched the Criterion, and then I watched uh, well, I watched the, the Classic Media, which is the one I own. Then, uh, and then I watched the Criterion. 
and I couldn't find anything. The only thing that bothered me the whole film was how fake that helicopter looked when uh, when Godzilla attacks attacks the island. The storm comes in; it's a hurricane. Oh yeah, storm that comes through, and that helicopter's rolling around, and that just didn't. Everything else looked realistic enough for me to pass muster. But that helicopter did not pass the bus. <laughs> no. <even at> <laughs> like, in fact, I thought at first I thought when I I said, "Well, maybe it's just in the American version." And no, it's, I thought maybe I said maybe we added it and, and it's cheap and it's it just didn't match the rest of the film. That one scene didn't match the rest of the film. I thought I'm like, just that doesn't look realistic. And the rest, you know, buildings getting knocked over, everything else I thought was top notch. Yeah. That's uh, what that's the only thing I found wrong with it. And I think um, we're really having a nitpick yeah. to get to those, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. we have a really nitpick because uh, everything else, as far as story, as far as special effects, as far as it, if there's nothing in there that shouldn't be in there. Like if if I were to go in there and re-edit it, it'd be impossible. Everything in there, there's no wasted scene in that movie that I, that I, that I can think oh, of anyway, I, off I the can, top of my head or throw it. Yeah, I can agree. There's not a wasted scene on there. Nope. Usually, uh, any movie you could say, you know what, that's not really needed. Or you know, uh, you know, you hear about all these director's cuts of movies and they add scenes or they take away. You know, this one, I don't think you could best it at all um as far as the movie itself goes um that's what i that, that's the only thing i found i didn't like and uh, the best thing i like about uh, about the movie is of course the story um godzilla you said he, he in that scene he looked soulless but i think this is one of the few monster movies you have for that creature I mean, it's a monster movie with a creature that has a soul, I guess. It's the only thing I can think of. In other words, oh, how can I put this? It's not, he's not just a, I, 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 I always reference Tarantula because it's one of my favorites. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I love that Tarantula movie. Tarantula was, was just a spider coming along and, and attacking. And Godzilla was more than just a monster. He was the incarnation of, uh, you mentioned it earlier. He's the he's basically the animal incarnation of the nuclear bomb. This is you know because yep. that's what he was. His breath was basically radiation, pure radiation. I mean, when he attacks Tokyo and breathes his breath on people, which you know, and, and they die instantly. They oh, scream yeah. in horror and they and they just catch fire and they they you know even that looked realistic. Well, that was. I mean, it didn't I was, look um, fake. It looked realistic. It did, it like, and I don't. I don't mean to interrupt yeah. you there. I do want to point out for those listening. Me and Mark were talking about this earlier. That's actually a scene that was cut from the, or sh- extremely shortened in the American version, because right. um, he does. He looks right down at a group of people on the streets and lights them ablaze. Um, and it's yes. you know, and it is. I mean, it just shows. I mean, it is. I mean, that's what the the, the nuclear weapon. That's what the atom bomb does. I do want to point that out. Sorry. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ruben. No, 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 uh, no problem. And that's that's what I liked about the movie is it didn't sugarcoat it. It didn't sugarcoat that that hey, this is what happens. Uh, you know, uh, you know. I, I referenced the Blue Oyster Cult song Godzilla. History shows again and again. You know what happens with the what, what nature does with the folly of man. It, it's just you know you mess around with nature. Uh, and I like that. I also liked, which is, uh, it, they do reference it in the American Godzilla, but in, in Gojira, they make it more clear that Godzilla existed before the nuclear bomb. Yeah. He was just eradicated and it, and it mutated him. But the old man talks about it. The island has the, the rituals that they do. Right, Godzilla yeah. Godzilla was not, yeah, he was not just created because of it. He was there. I mean, they sacrificed girls to him. When uh, when the fishing was bad, is what the old man said. Yeah, which was also and, and, cut from the American you know, version as yeah. well. Yeah, so they would sacrifice young girls to them to, to satisfy him that he would come on the island and, and feast on the humans. You know, that that's what he would eat. 
he would eat mankind, is what, what uh, he, the old man said. Yep. So I like the fact that they said, he, in other words, he was part of nature. And all that the nuclear bomb or the H-bomb did, which is what they called it in the movie, the H-bomb, or they never called it the atomic bomb. I always, uh, if I remember correctly, they just called it the H-bomb. Yeah, yeah, that's right. They always called it the H-bomb. Yeah, the H-bomb. And, and what it is, and it's all it did is the H-bomb just mutated. Godzilla and made him into an even hor- more horrifying monster, you know, and, and it awakened him, but he was there all along. So, um, and a lot of people think, well, he was created by, well, no, he was already there. He was just basically mutated. Yep. And, and you know, his nuclear breath came from that. And he's basically, uh, whatever he touches is radiation, you know, where they're testing, where they're down there with the Geiger counter and his, footprint you know right and, the footprints uh, were the, even the, they say the the well on that side of the island is radiated and they can't yeah. drink from the water yeah yeah they say the well the well on the other side of the island is fine but that one isn't you know and so it's like whatever he touches it gets eradicated and and, and he basically kills it makes it uh non-livable um and uh so what i like about this about it too is the fact that they the way they incorporated all of the story they didn't and like we mentioned earlier they didn't just make it oh well america bombed us and it's all their fault it was kind of like mankind did this mankind is what forced godzilla out of wherever he was to attack yep then- you know uh, they could have easily been so angry with what what happened is and, and made a movie where he attacked san francisco or something you know, they could have done that just as well. Um, but no, they, they did it in a way that was respectful um, for history, basically, on what happened. You know, uh, and, and it was the we thing that, uh, that, that I really caught my, caught my attention. It's like, you know, they're not really placing blame. They're just saying we as mankind don't know when to stop sometimes. And we keep going and we keep going. Sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it's it's not. Just like uh, Ferrazal was saying, it's the oxygen. He basically compared the oxygen. He just came out and said it. Hey, this is the same as the H bomb. In the wrong hands, it's 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 uh, convenient. Can, that's why he burned his plans. So he yep. burned them all. That's why he cut and then the took his life at the end of the movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah he didn't exactly. want anybody to get a hold of that technology. So that's what I liked about it. In the short version, anyway. <laughs> right, uh, Mark. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Those were two pretty good. I, you know, with, with me, it's of course. Or what uh, you didn't like? Then what yeah. did you like? Well, I'll just yeah, pretty much go through. I, there's n- n- the only thing I didn't like on it was the first time I ever watched it. I didn't have any subtitles, so I was kind of lost. <laughs> and uh, but in watching it, it's such a darker movie than King of the Monsters that that you really see probably more pain the Japanese fans are feeling as a whole uh, than, than what I could as, a, as an American watching it. So I think that um, kind of depressing, but at the same time, when, you know, when you're a kid and, and you're growing up, you're thinking, oh, this is, this is awesome, this is awesome, and not understanding where people are coming from uh, to the point of, what we're talking about now with with nuclear bombs and and you know atomic bombs and so you don't look at them as a kid that way as we do now and so uh, probably the the overall darkness of the movie as an adult kind of affects me uh where uh the movie itself after seeing king of the monster first still really got into it, still really loved it, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. I think uh, definitely with, with well, I think it's uh, Godzilla is a symbol that's really become a legend that'll never die because it, it, he's always going to be relevant. You know, look at t- today, you know what I mean? And, and of course, I've stated in the main podcast episodes um, that, we, you know, we're not, we won't get political on any of these shows, but just to look at the world right now with what we're, the world is dealing with when it comes to North Korea and it's denuclear, denuclearization at this time, nuclear weapons is still such a scary threat that is very prevalent today. You know what I mean? And that, it's still the ultimate weapon. It still, is. You know what I mean? So yeah. 
that will always keep Godzilla alive because, in the, you know, I mean, in the back of especially the Japanese's minds and a lot of our minds who, who have seen the original one will know uh, the metaphor that he is uh, of, of how yep. dangerous these things are. So, and I think that'll, that alone, let alone anything else that comes from Godzilla as far as his pop culture status, uh, how well he does at the box office, how well he does at the stores, that will keep the character alive. Till the end of the till the end of time, in my opinion. Yeah, and uh, I will say one thing: uh, Godzilla, no matter what form he's in, like even in even the '98 version, the Zilla, so I, I call him or Gino. I don't, I don't give him the God. I don't give him the <laughs> I don't give him the God part. <laughs> no, Zilla no. Is but because of Zilla, it reintroduced Godzilla to America, so to speak. You know, another generation got to see it. So there was toys at Toys R Us. There was books. There was comics. There was all kinds of stuff. It, it was, and it was Bandai. It was the Japanese Godzilla. You know, yeah, uh, Trendmaster put out that whole that whole line of toys. You know, they put out their 1998 Godzilla toys, but they also put out the Japanese uh, Bandai toys. They did in, um, in multiple series, right? There yeah. was Monster Wars, yeah, Monster Island. Series. Oh yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and beautifully sculpted. They were green. <laughs> right. They were, you know, you know, I retract really that. <laughs> that previous yeah, statement. <laughs> they were green. But, you know, so uh, Godzilla, you know, every generation has gotten a dose of him. And, that, you know, his longevity, like you said, he, he will always be around because, I mean, look, look at this, a whole new generation, 2014 Godzilla, and they're going to get, uh, a high quality version of Godzilla. Oh yeah, you know, um, you know these, these these people that are making these movies are respecting what Toho wanted to do with Godzilla and Godzilla's original storyline, and, and this this new crop of, of producers and directors and writers are respecting that, and uh, that just goes to show how much Godzilla, you know. Uh, how Godzilla is thought of in, in the movie industry. He's just not just another monster, you know, um, you know, some, you know, how many monster movies has there been? It's one and done. And that's it. Oh Never man. Yeah. We can go through yeah. Yon yeah. Gary, like Gorgo, John it. Behemoth, yeah. Giant Claw, you yeah. know, even be some 20,000 fathoms. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's plenty of them. The one and done. Um, but Godzilla and maybe King Kong, I would put King Kong in that same category. Those are will always be, um, you know, uh, they'll be up in a pedestal. In other words, you know, the, these guys would always be around. And, uh, and yeah, and I always rail on that 98 Godzilla or Godzilla, but because of them, I finally got the official versions of the uh, of Godzilla versus Ghidorah, Godzilla, Mothra, uh, Destroya, Space Godzilla. Those were all released. As a matter of fact, uh, That's I true. bought those off of QVC. Yeah, off yeah. of QVC. They were selling Godzilla toys. On QVC. <laughs> I think at that point, I think at that point, you know, especially when they did the when TriStar released not long after the uh, the movies, you know, yeah, on, on DVD, I think they kind of felt at that point uh, we've got to fix what we just did, so <laughs> let's give them something they don't have. Yeah, yet, exactly. You know? It's yeah. like because we so, really and I bought those. Uh, yeah, QVC was selling those on VHS, and then when they came out on DVD, and then. You know, on and on. It's just, uh, um, man. To, uh, you know, to be honest with ahead. you, when it comes to those TriStar releases, I I don't know that I actually owned one or even bought one until maybe in the last couple of years. Really? Yeah. Oh man, I bought them. Right, the QVC was selling them. Well, of course, the Godzilla at that time, the, uh, um, I was getting them from Video Kaiju. So I mean, when I was ordering them. Because even growing up, I had you know in my early teenage years when it comes to Godzilla, I was able to get my hands on a couple subtitle viewings, and ah. for me, it's always going to be better. There's only one Godzilla film that I will willingly watch dubbed, and that's the 1964's Mothra vs Godzilla, because I feel the dubbing ah. on that movie is flawless flawless um but i always got the subtitle versions you know especially as a teenager so i was ordering from video daikaiju and i just never did i never got around to buying the tristar versions the english dub ones until yeah yeah maybe within the last three four years because i just want to have them in my collection right yeah and uh so yeah so uh to me i mean uh, before that down here south texas but 
like Godzilla 2000, that didn't get released down here in the theaters. You're lucky enough it to get it in the theater. I, oh, have to wait, man. I have to wait for the DVD. Yeah. Oh, that was an experience so, and a half. And actually, yeah, I, I take so it back. I, you know, so. I was wrong in stating that was not that was my favorite experience. One of my favorite experiences of Godzilla that actually was not my first time seeing the real Godzilla on the big screen. My first time seeing him was G Fest ninety five ninety six in Chicago. In Chicago. Because I actually got oh. to see uh I it was ninety six. I'm pretty sure it was ninety six. I remember I saw um I got to see Godzilla vs. Destroya, Gamma Guardian of the Universe and I want to say that was my first time viewing Matango as well, Attack of the Mushroom People. Um, was at the theater uh, there next to um, the Wyndham Pl- the Wyndham Hotel for G Fest. So I actually got to see three uh-huh. giant monster films. Well, Matango's not so much a giant monster film, but still a Tokusatsu film. Um, so actually, I'm sorry, Destroy It was my first um, Godzilla film on the big screen. Which is kind of wow. yeah. Which is kind of I mean that's if you're gonna see one on the big screen, that's definitely yeah. one of the ones to do it. So yeah, and then and then that one, um, my nephew actually cried when he saw Destroyer. Oh, dude! Godzilla died. Yeah, he cried. You know, he was he was uh for he was twelve or something like that, but he, he actually that, cried. That was, I, mean, that, it's, it's because, I think that was around my know. age, and yeah, I'm pretty much I, I'm pretty sure I teared up. And I mean, um, not like I did in '85 as a child. You know, when he at the end of that, yeah. when you think he dies, but uh, yeah, uh, he's going to the volcano. Yes, sir. Actually, I, I my son sat down. Uh, Gavin, he's uh, four, sat down and watched Godzilla 1985 with me the other day, and uh, almost cried there at the very end. He thought Godzilla. Was, I had to stop and go. He's not dying. It's okay. I mean, he, I know he's falling in the volcano, but he'll be back. I promise. Because he was bent. He was so torn thinking that Godzilla was dying, and I was like, it's okay, it'll be okay. So, so guys, thank you so much. Um, of course, Mark will be on every episode with this as my co-host for the Monster Movie Stomp Down, part of Sludgecast. Ruben, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to call in with us tonight and review what, in I think all three of our opinions, is arguably the greatest monster movie of all time. Uh, is that a fair? Oh, I agree. You got that agree. right, yeah. Absolutely. And I had a lot of fun on this. It was great. Awesome. Well, Ruben, you are definitely more than welcome to come back on any other ones that you like to. Uh, of course, I'll be posting ahead of time what the schedule will be for the movies. And uh, it, it wasn't until thinking of what the next movie will be for next month's uh, Monster Movie Stomp Down. Because, again, we're going to go chronologically on the Monster Movie Stomp Down through every Godzilla film from the first one, which we did tonight, to whatever current one is at the time. Because Godzilla isn't going nowhere and he is just growing and more movies are coming. Um, but we're going to do that every other month and then take a break in between each month and do something different Um, after talking and mentioning briefly GMK uh, which was done by Shisuke Kaneko who is a phenomenal I think arguably maybe one of the greatest Japanese directors there is I think the next episode we'll actually go through and do the 90's Gamera trilogy Mark you think that's a good I can I can call that one yes Ruben would you be down to listen to those maybe join in on one of them Sure, I've got the trilogy. Awesome. So that will be the that'll be the one for next month, guys. So if you haven't seen or know who Gamera is, Gamera was Godzilla's biggest rival in Japan. Came out in nineteen sixty five. It was really odd because it came out in black and white at the time when color film was still very big and tons of movies were done in color at the time. Dae, uh, the company who made it, just didn't have quite the budget. However, he was a huge success. Uh, went on to make films all the way up into 1980 with Gamera Super Monster um, and then yeah. disappeared for many years. And then Shisuke Kaneko came out uh, with Dae and rebooted the series into a trilogy Um Gamera Guarding the Universe followed next year, the following year, um, by Gamera 2 Advent of Legion. Or actually, there's multiple names. We'll discuss it on that episode. And then followed up, uh, closing the trilogy out with Gamera Revenge of Eris, which, if we can get into that debate, Ruben, that would be a good one for you to get back into uh, the third Gamera film because that could be a very good debate because it can be argued by many that that actually is the greatest John Monster film ever made. I don't. Th- I think Godzilla is is the biggest staple, but there are, are there are some arguments uh, that can been be made. Online, that's been an online debate for a long time. <laughs> it, it has. That movie is quite unreal. So so that's what we'll do, guys. Thank you all so much for listening. Um, again, catch us next month. Uh, me, Mark, and then whoever our next guest is going to be, we'll let you know ahead of time for the viewing of Gamera: Guarding the Universe, 1995 is when this came out by director Shusuke Kaneko. Has an awesome twist and change to the character. Again, thank you all so much. This has been the Monster Movie Stomp Down from all of us here at Sludgecast, including Ruben, the guest. We say good night. Good night. <laughs> Just got the t- You have 
you fear which might become reality. You have to jump, which is reality.